Thanks, How long have you been growing that? Um, I, I take, I shaved it completely off, like to the skin, uh, September of last year. So, um, so like a, a year, year and, and a half? year and two, three months. And you got that. I got this. Damn, that's hard, dude. I don't know what's. Uh, believe me, I, I have nothing to do with it. I just was like tried it one day. The reason why I didn't want to ever grow a beard is because my dad had a beard and fuck that guy. <laughs> fuck that fuck that guy you know and I didn't want to be anything like him and also I looked more like him too when I looked in the mirror when I started doing it I was like ah it's fine it's fine I'm a better man than this fucking sociopath sorry <laughs> I mean a lot of us can relate you know we got you know, I, I was seeing something about like you know no contact with our parents is self care in some cases you know I mean, some people yeah. have great parents some people don't anyway the reason why I didn't want to grow it was that but then my dear Randazzo was like, I want to see what the Charles beard looks like. And I was just like, all right, man, I love you. I'll grow a beard for you to see, you know. I was kind of curious, too. What was the furthest you had grown it before this? <laughs> There's like, um, like goatees, pictures of me with goatees. Um, and that was about it. I always like kept it real like gardened. <laughs> what is it? Gardened? No. Trimmed? Trimmed, groomed. Groomed. Neat, you know? All these words apply. <laughs> Gardened. <laughs> Gardened? <laughs> yeah, just hoed garden, all over my face. Garden my face for a minute, you guys. Sorry. I'll be right back. <laughs> that's a bet. That's a bet. <laughs> um, Is, did we already start this podcast? Dude, we are kind of just, we, we fly by the seat of our pants, man. Like we, it's great, man. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. I guess we can formally introduce. Uh, mm -hmm. I, thank you for being on the show. Oh, uh, thank you for being on Liner Notes Season 2. I was so happy to get the email. I was like, oh, shit, it's man, on. We, I, I've seen you around all over town. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not just throughout Richmond. I, I haven't seen you outside of Richmond. And I know you're in Charlottesville and all these other places, but mm -hmm. I've seen you at open mics, you know, performing with different people as part of ensembles and mm -hmm. bands and your own trio and quartet and, like, I'm just always impressed with the the sound that the group that you're in produces. So I like that you can be a team player, mm -hmm. but also, man, you freaking wail. <laughs> like your like your fingers and breath control is like really crazy to me. Mm. Um, so I, I really wanted to have you on the show. Yeah, um, I'm glad to be here, man. Plus, I I just like talking to people that are super tapped into the scene. Oh yeah. Um, and you know, we can talk about you not starting here in Richmond, but mm -hmm. kind of coming here and looking at it from an outsider. But mm -hmm. like, I mean, maybe we should just talk about that. Like, how did you come in to Richmond as being an outsider and, and kind of make yourself a part of the scene? In 04, in I came from New York City, went to the new school in 92, studied jazz performance, composition, and you know, stayed in the city until 2004. And then I moved to Virginia. And uh, just to get on my feet, I stayed with my mom out in Louisa. She has a beautiful property out there with two houses so we stayed in this house for a little bit I had a little baby girl and then as soon as we got to Virginia I had another little baby girl and uh, and so we stayed out in Louisa for about three years paid all our own bills but no rent you know because the house was out there and it was my mom and it was a good situation you know Hell yeah yeah <laughs> and and so uh, um, I just uh, started teaching first uh, I played some gigs and then I started doing some teaching and then I got this gig at Miller's. I was in Charlottesville because um, I got a job in Charlottesville. As soon as I got to Louisa in 04, I, was, I had to go get a job. So I got a job at um, Best Buy in Charlottesville. So I wanted, what, to what sell compu I wanted to sell computers. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go sell some computers because I could. I'll sell computers like crazy. And they put me in the appliances department to sell like washers and dryers and stuff. Sick. 
though. But, you know, I had two little babies, so I killed it. <laughs> I was like employee of the month for three months straight at Best Buy. Be like, you can put any, any uh, kind of soiled laundry in here. I'm a dad, trust me. <laughs> no, I just like, you go home and you see two little babies like, so what you gonna do for me, man? <laughs> like, you, you know how it goes. Motivation. Yeah, it's motivation. So it's Am I gonna get fed tonight? Do I care? I'm selling whatever, you know? So anyway, yeah, and so I started playing gigs and, um, and people, uh, I think the first person, I started playing gigs in Richmond in 2010. And the first person to call me for a gig was Jason Jenkins because he knew about me from New York. I made a bunch of records with some some amazing like virtuosos in New York, this guy, Omer Avital, he had a sextet with four saxophones, bass and drums, and some amazing saxophone players in that band. I was also in that band, and uh, we, you know, we, it was, it was an incredible band. Yeah. So anyway, Jason was like, Char yeah, uh, he went to see Omer Avital uh, play uh, shows in Richmond, and Omer, and he went back to meet Omer, and Omer was like, hey man, uh, do you know Charles Owens? And he's like, yeah, I know Charles Owens. It's like, yeah, he's in, he's in uh, Charlottesville. You should call him for a gig. And Jason was like, yeah, right, sure, cool. <laughs> you know, whatever. That's not true, is it? Is it really <laughs> true? That's, that was the, you know, Jason tells me this story. And so Jason calls me for a gig. And the first gig I had in Richmond was about 2010. And it was Jason Jenkins, Alan Parker, and Devon Harris and me. It's a good lineup. And I, the first time I had met any of them. And uh, I remember, man, we started playing. And, like, I played a little bit of shit. And Devon said, Played a little shit, but, but, but back, you know, and I was like, and we looked at each other and we were like, oh man, it's on. And the whole gig was just so fun. And I was like, oh my God. And then the second gig I ever played in Richmond was with um, uh, Mekong Express and the Get Fresh Horns. Before the Answer Brew Pub, we actually played at Mekong. And I remember, uh, I always laugh about this with Kelly Strawbridge. Um, we didn't take a break. We played for two and a half hours straight. And I'm like, is this how they do this shit in Richmond, man? Like, nobody takes break? I was, like, so tired. <laughs> but it was also killing because, you know, it was Kelly Strawbridge and Todd Harrington and Chris and, and uh, Ben White, you know. On, it was, like, the band. And I was subbing for JC. <laughs> JC Cool. Shouts to JC Cool. That's another guy that got me so many gigs on the scene because... Once he knew I was here and once he knew I was like a good, like I'll show up and do a good job on a saxophone sub, he started giving me all these gigs and man, he really helped me out at the beginning. Not just with gigs, but you know, when you go to the gigs, you like meet people, uh, you, you know, you have an opportunity to play well for them and meet them and then keep the sub chair, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so JC was a big part of like, once he knew he could count on me to like go and do a good job on sub gigs for him, I started meeting a ton of people. And uh, so I would be on Interna Interstate 64, like back and forth from Charlottesville to Richmond. And I have been for since then, <laughs> and I still am. Because, <laughs> you know, I have a bunch of st stuff still happening in Charlottesville. I have a bunch of students, lots of gigs, lots of connections. And uh, it's great, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy that, like, you know, you said that... Um he didn't believe that like you were in Virginia because I mean at, at, up until that point you had been up in New York the whole time like you I don't I don't know if it was a residency or not but you were at Smalls a lot like you lived at Smalls for a hot minute didn't residency you? Yeah, yeah like I was an a official resident <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so like you you had kind of made a name for yourself and an impact in like the <laughs> New York jazz scene mm -hmm. um, and then you know you come down here and what I kind of want to know is like from studying and watching, I watched a lot of videos of you at Smalls, like oh. playing at like 320 beats per minute, and like just wild stuff. Yeah, some of those videos I just go like, oh my God, thank goodness I'm not doing that right now. And, and <laughs> right, right, right. It's just like sort of PTSD, like, <gasps> it's so fast. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> but, but like, I think from like your experience there, and I'll let you tell this, but mm -hmm. like there was a great sense of community in that space. Like the musicians came there to get better to to create and be dope how and i and i am focused on trying to bring that energy here to richmond so like how do we take something you've seen or been in a, a part of at smalls in new york and kind of create the same type of energy and exchange here like in richmond mm. well uh i would say you're right about the sense of community in smalls uh, it was started for that reason mitch borden is the guy who started smalls and he wanted it to be a space where 
musicians could come and play and make money, but also musicians could come and learn and have a community and a support system. Um, you know, he would do all kinds of stuff like um, the burrito place down the street would have rice and beans and salsa left over at the end of every day. And so he would go and get that, and put it on a hot plate so musicians would come and be able to eat for the day if they needed to. Um, uh, Smalls is still like that. Um, it has changed over the years uh, to be able to survive and be a viable business. When Mitch started Smalls, it was um, $10 to get in, and that was for the whole night, for all the music, you know. And, uh, man, uh, I think that uh, the Roots Jam it, uh, has, has really got a nice sense of community with it. Everyone's really supportive, um, and it's a welcoming vibe. Shouts to Calvin. Yeah, I, that's... Uh, <laughs> shouts to all those people, man. The, the scene, is, it's like a really great scene. A lot of great singers, a lot of great um, rhythm section players, some good horn players. We need more horn players out there. I'm going to try to go every Wednesday. More. Yeah. yeah I no, mean, uh, Monday, uh, Mondays. Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm so excited that the Roots Jam is back. Like, you know, mm -hmm. when that kind of shut down during the whole, like, lockdown era, it was... It felt like the end of a little bit of an era because, you know, it was at the dark room before. I was going almost every Monday, and so I'm so glad that it's back over at Black Iris. Mm. Shout-outs to Calvin. Yeah, Calvin, Barry Pete, making it happen. Barry Pete making uh, Black Iris sound better and better all the time. Yeah, mm. it, it's, it's, it's becoming a very cool spot, like yeah. the spot to go to for live music, mm -hmm. which I dig. Mm -hmm. But you've also performed at, you know, bigger venues. I've seen you at Friday Cheers now, you know what I'm saying? Like, that was amazing. How, how opening was that? up for Butcher Brown. Opening up for Butcher Brown, <laughs> yeah. playing with some of the members for Butcher Brown, right? Yeah, exactly. That was, um, I just remember getting the, getting the text about that and, you know, being so happy. You know, there's moments where you get opportunities to play gigs that you really want to play or even that you didn't know you wanted to play until they were presented, you know? And so it was like good, happy moments. I, I, I got the text from my man Ian Hendrickson Smith in 2017, 16. No, I was 17 to play the concert for Charlottesville with The Roots, you know. And he's like, hey, man, you want to play concert in Charlottesville with The Roots in front of 55,000 people? And I was just like, Bleh. you know, total, like, plots. Yeah. How do you get yourself <laughs> prepared for a show like that? There's nothing that could prepare me for that. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, what was, uh, what was the other one? The, the first thing that you asked me about that uh, before Friday the... Friday Cheers? Oh, yeah, Friday Cheers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I just remember being really happy. And there's some cats from uh, New York, some friends from New York that were um, in Virginia, and they came, and it was like not only a really killing show, but, uh, you know, it was a beautiful hang during and afterwards. So when, I, when and then my job was done, and I just got to chill backstage and see Butcher Brown, you know, play like an amazing set to a packed island <laughs> you know it was so great man and it was just like richmond because you've such I, a beautiful richmond moment <laughs> agree yeah you said that butcher brown is like your muse oh yeah that's definitely uh i mean come on man haven't we all just been in our car listening to butcher brown driving on like you know 195 looking at the skyline and be like this is perfect <laughs> this is perfect this is exactly what i should be listening to you know Do you find like, you know, they inspire you to try things or maybe to push your own boundaries a little bit as an artist? Well, yeah. I mean, when I got when I got here from New York, you know, especially in the '90s and the early 2000s, New York was very much about swing, mm. and uh, you know, and that's great, like you know, swinging, improvisational music, you know. And so when I got here, I was all about that, all about being like, um, you know, playing swinging music, and I still am. But then Virginia is not all about swing. Yeah, we swing in Virginia for sure, but like there's this element of country and, f and funkiness and greasiness and, and dirt, you know, and slickness, but in just the Virginia way, just that, that this, country, this country way, you know. And uh, Butcher Brown absolutely made me change my whole thing up. Like uh, a good example would be 2017 Charles Owens Quartet album. It's called As One. 
that whole record is me just saying, I love you, Richmond. <laughs> really, you know, because it's Kelly Strawbridge on drums, DJ Harrison on the Wurlitzer, Andrew on Andrew and Dazzle on electric bass. We played, we did it direct to two inch tape at Montrose, which is like, you know, and uh, there's songs there that, um, you know, that's inspired me to use electric instruments. My first time ever using electric instruments on a record was that. That was the first time? That was the first time. Yeah, it was always just Dang. upright bass, acoustic piano, and drums, or just acoustic bass and drums, you know. And so, and, and it really, they, Butcher Brown and, and bands like that from Virginia made me look at what my musical roots were, you know, and what I was really feeling other than Coltrane's music, and other than Sonny Rollins' music, and other than like my original swinging music. What was in my heart, what was in my um, soul growing up, you know, and it wasn't that. It was other songs. It was like funky 70s music and 80s music and backbeats and, and rock and roll, you know, and like Butcher Brown has all that and, and hip hop, too. I love I remember distinctly being like nine years old, like blasting Run DMC at the playground on my boombox, you know, and thinking, God, this music makes me feel so cool when I listen to it. That's why I love, I think, my favorite thing about rap and listening to hip-hop is how it makes me feel, like, just cool. Put it on in any situation, you know what I mean? Like, it definitely provides, like, an ambiance or a vibe <laughs> yeah, sometimes. It just makes me feel cool. And I remember feeling that there. So, yeah, Butcher Brown totally changed me up. And Devon, you know, meeting Devon and uh, uh, DJ Harrison, I should say, you know, but he will always be Devon to me, too. Um, meeting him and seeing what an incredible multi-instrumentalist, composer, producer, engineer, studio builder. I mean, you know, my favorite drummer still to this day, you know, we're going to make a record this, this in March, me and Devon and Andy, so new Charles Owens Trio record in 2023. That'll be great. You heard it here. Yeah, first. That's the announcement. And <laughs> <Sick>. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be really fun. And, uh, you know, he's going to play drums on it, and he's still still my favorite drummer so yeah man that that band had a huge impact on me and a lot of people and still and everybody knows butcher brown now too which is wherever great. i go i'm like it's like a calling card for me <laughs> oh what's up what's up in virginia what's going on in richmond oh you know you know butcher brown of course i know butcher brown <laughs> always so shout out to butcher brown andy devon marcus morgan Corey. we love you guys man love you guys butcher brown mm -hmm. for sure um with that Virginia greasiness, country mm -hmm. kind of flavoring that yeah. you, you, you have learned since being down here, mm -hmm. ha, how much of that are you teaching when you are teaching kids? Because you said, you know, you, you teach music to different oh, people. Yeah. Like, are you applying these lessons as well? Always, man. Always. Yeah. Um, boy, my teaching has really uh, gotten great. Um, I've been teaching for 25 years. And I teach, you know, saxophone, of course, <clears throat> but I also teach a lot of other stuff like uh, jazz harmony, music theory, um, piano, composition, improvisation. I teach uh, people of all ages um, and levels uh, and genders. <laughs> I mean, like, it's great. I have such a huge swath of people that are so different. Uh, but they all come take lessons with me for one reason or another. It's great. I teach like people who are just starting. I teach professionals who want to like up their improvisational game. I uh, it's it's amazing, man. And um, without getting too deep into it, I think that what I like to teach my musician people is that the most powerful musicians uh, and the most powerful people really. <clears throat> Uh, they use their intellect and their instinct in symbiosis. So, like, there's a lot of people who are real intellectual about music, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe they have some fear about their instinctual side of music because there's some safety in the intellectual side of music. Right. There's some safety in the intellectual side of anything because it's factual, it's objective. Mm -hmm. There's an there's outline. Safety for, in it, yeah. yeah. So then the subject, then there's some people, as we know, that are just all heart and instinct, right? And they'll tell you, I don't know shit about theory, man, and I don't care because, and then you hear them and you're like, oh, God, 
that you sound amazing or whatever. It's just like, you know, and, and it's, a, but the real powerful musicians embrace both sides of that. They embrace their intellect and they embrace their instinction, in, instinctiveness, and then they use them in symbiosis. So where one fails, the other, the other doesn't fail and then in vice versa, you know? Yeah. And so that's what I try to teach as an overall thing to anybody that I teach, you know, is like you have to be both. And, you know, music theory is really important, but I try to keep it in its place. Music theory is nothing without music. Music theory is a reaction to music. Um, music theory by itself doesn't really even, without the music, doesn't even really exist like this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like so, uh, it, and, and it's, it's, you know, um, there's a lot of problems with, you know, just thinking about music theory, si the system of music theory is the end all be all way to think about music. That's real problematic too. So while I try to um, stress the importance of music theory, I also try to keep it in its place, which I think is really important. Um, you got to know the rules in order to break the rules sometimes, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, if you break, if you're, you don't know the rules when you break them, then you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> I mean, everything has to be intentional, too. Like, improvisation is something that we all do. Everybody in this room is great at. Uh, and what we, improv, in, what we improvise is music. I mean, excuse me, is English. And our instruments are our tongue and our teeth, lips, our articulators, and our voice box. And everyone here in this room is a virtuoso. Improv improviser when it comes to that. Of course you are. We have to do it to communicate. Mm -hmm. We do it every day, all day. So imagine if we just spent half the time playing music as we did speaking English or improvising music as we did speaking English, we'd all be pretty killing, <laughs> you know? Um, so, and that's another thing that, you know, when I teach improvisation, I sort of, that's my opening line about improvisation is that everyone's already good at it. I mean, no one carries around a book to remind them what to say when someone says something to them. As, as he looks around the room, making sure nobody's pulling out something out their pocket. <laughs> no, I'm, Actually, I'm in teacher sir. mode. No, you got me in teacher mode now, so I'm just like pontificating. Nah, you're good, man. <laughs> Giving you guys a little soliloquies. Well, yeah. I, I, I was just super curious about it, because like, you know, it's, it's one thing to observe something or to intrinsically understand it, and it's another thing to teach it to somebody else. Mm. And so, like, there's a lot of times where I think I know what I'm doing, but I can't explain to you why I know what I'm doing. Yeah. And so, like, you know, with you learning, like, a whole new kind of flavor, you know what I'm saying, like, mm -hmm. a, of this Virginia style of music, like, I wondered how long did that process kind of play out where you felt comfortable enough to go, hey, this is what I've been doing. Immediately. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I get, get onto something, like, uh, I, I, it doesn't take me long to understand that it's, it's either the shit or it's not, you know? Right. And so, uh, you know, with Butcher Brown and the Virginia scene, I immediately was like, oh, there's, like, some amazing cats down here, you know? And, uh, and so I immediately started preaching it and teaching it. Sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, as, soon as, I, as soon as it came across, I mean, it's obvious that it's killing, so... Speaking of shit that is obviously killing, mm -hmm. um, I wanted to talk about Golden Moments that <laughs> came out in 2022. Thank you so um, much. No that. problem. We actually, before you got here, we were we were running through like some of your records and oh, just cool. you know playing a bunch of joints. Um, but I, I, your sound, man, is so sharp. You know what I'm saying? Like it, everything sounds good. It sounds crisp and clean, and everything's set where it's supposed to. So a you know, good job on the mastering and the mixing, but also like Adrian Olson. A, show shout out to Adrian Olson, mm -hmm. but. I want to talk about like your arrangements, mm -hmm. you know, because you, I, I'm assuming you do the arrangements for the quartet and the trio. Uh, we all do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the arrangements come up, come about. Um, generally, I have an idea of what I want the arrangements to be, but it's usually starts out kind of loose. And uh, the way that I like to record records is I like to get the band and the repertoire together, and then play gigs for like. I don't know, a year on the material. Mm. And that's exactly what I did with this quartet. Uh, Brian Caputo, Daniel Clark, and Andrew Randazzo. We, um, 
I, like I said, I'm, I love music from the 70s, and there's a lot of mu songs from the 70s uh, uh, on that record. And so I got the arrangements together in my head and brought most of them. Uh, and they started to come, they start to come to life when we play gigs on them. Uh, and then they, they're formed that way by everyone. Um, y yeah, initially most of them were my ideas to like, let's play this tune. Here's a couple of ideas I have for the arrangement. But then on the gigs is when it happens. Okay. And it's always cool because it happens sort of naturally. And then at the end of the gig, we'll kind of decide whether we want to keep it or not. And I record a lot of stuff, too. That's important because we'll do some stuff and then forget about it. But if it's on the recording, I'll come next rehearsal and be like, hey, we did this in this last gig. Let's just keep that in because it was so gallant, you know. Um, and, and so that's how these arrangements generally go. But the song choices were you know, most of the songs on there were just songs that I grew up with when I was a kid. And, you know, when you hear songs when you're a kid, anything happens when you're a kid. You, you're so impressionable. They just stick with you. And so playing those songs, like playing the melodies and everything is so natural to me because, like, If You Leave Me Now by Chicago is like, I was like seven, eight years old, just like doing housework with my family on Saturdays. And I was just on the radio all the time. And I remember particularly just being stopped by that and just like stopping and listening be like oh, that's so beautiful like as a little kid you know uh, and and uh, and also the way i pick songs is you know the melody has to be really strong because i'm not going to sing like if a melody is cool and it depends on the lyrics to be cool that's cool but it's not good for a horn player because like if it's like a repeated note you know It'd just be like da 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 <laughs> like it just sound weird, you know? Yeah. Uh, but you know, if you leave me now, it's boo doo 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 mm 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 like it's by itself is like killing, you know? So because I'm not gonna say the words. So if it feels good to play the melody on the saxophone, then that's a really important criteria. There's songs that I've wanted to play that just, I tried to play them and I was like, ah, it's not gonna work, but it's still killing, you know? So that, I ha it has to be a really strong, varied melody, and man, all the melodies on that record are so killing. What was the, what was the first piece of music that you bought yourself? Oh, like, uh, in other words, like, like record. You went, yeah, you went out, yeah, you copped a record or yes. a tape or something. What did, what did you get for you? The very first record I got was a Dolly Parton album, and I remember, it was three pictures of her um, in like jeans and like in different poses like <laughs> and uh, uh, I just remember being like early on I was like a real big Dolly Parton fan. <laughs> what, uh, what song was on that record? Ah oh, man. Uh, hopefully in post-production you guys will bring it we'll up. We'll definitely fact check it. Yeah, <laughs> we can we definitely fact check it. Um, but it's like you know three pictures of her in, in jeans and there there was a hit song on that um, when it's right, it's right. Everybody. Some, somebody look up Dolly Parton songs right now. Uh, oh, it's all good. All right, so we can snap you right back in. Is it Islands in the Stream? Uh huh. Okay. We're together. Uh huh. That joint. Was is that on Kenny, that one? Kenny Rogers. Was, Kenny Rogers. It was it Kenny Rogers? So anyway, it was that. It took like and nine then, people to fact check that. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, I remember really early on buying um, Led Zeppelin One. You know, the one that starts out in the days of my youth, I was old, what a, the first tune and the first you know first side one, and I bought it on vinyl. And then also Journey Escape. Hell yeah. Don't That's stop a good believing. One. That one will stick with you for your well, life. I mean, like, you know, dude, I remember it was like I was 10. And I just was like, I gotta go get Journey, the Journey album. And I remember going to the mall, to the record store, buy it on vinyl, being very excited. Hell yeah. No, that's classic. Yeah, I think my first three were like Black Street, Weird Al, and Live, the alternative rock group. Dang, dude, that's nice. I remember getting those at a birthday party one time. Sp Ooh. Space Jam soundtrack was early on as well. Space Jam, yeah. <laughs> it's got D'Angelo. It's got you know. Does Jay it? You don't know about the Space Jam soundtrack? Sorry, I know. We're, yo, we're gonna play the Space Jam soundtrack after this is over. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Richmond Legend, D'Angelo. Oh, is this is this the Dolly Parton one? That's it. Perfect. That's it. Perfect. All right, great. Yeah. 
Nah. <laughs> yeah, I always like to kind of dig into like, just see like, what was your first like? Because yeah. everybody gets music played for them. Everybody likes stuff that their parents yeah. have. Mm -hmm. But the moment that you kind of step out independently to form your own like yeah, voice yeah. Is, a, is, a, is a big moment. Maybe it doesn't feel like it back then, but. Dude, I was always a big music head. Um, and just to, just to counteract those records, I remember uh, also asking my father for this time, I don't know if anybody remembers Time Life books, right? And they would like give you a series of books or records or whatever. And I, as, a, as a very young kid, I was super into classical music because I really loved Mozart. And one of the things that actually got me into music and one and the thing that made me want to be a musician was Amadeus, that movie Amadeus. Yeah, yeah. It came out when I was 11. And Played movie, in music classrooms everywhere. Dude, that movie is amazing, man. <laughs> There's certain moments where I was just like, oh yeah, music is really magic, and yeah, this is what I'm gonna do, you know? And so I got way into Mozart, and so I asked my dad for this Time Life book series called Great Men of Music. And it was, <laughs> it was so killing, man, and I wish I still had it. But every month they would send a box that was like about that size, and it had four cassettes in it and a book about the composer, and then four cassettes of just like the greatest. And it was Beethoven, Bach, and Brahms. So every month I would get it, and I'd just be like so excited. And I was way, and I just remember, man, I was like super into classical music when I was like really young. <laughs> you know, I just loved it. Like Mozart just. From the beginning. Mozart just got me, man. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, so like I had huge varied of influences from a long from an early age it was cool nah that's dope it is man. you had me wanting to be like nardwar here for a second and be like wow well, i've got great <laughs> men of go. jazz great men of music and i'd just be like oh my god you're <laughs> charles owens we have to know <laughs> um, yeah i know how did you know that you're charles owens we have to know i know it's so funny <laughs> Doodle -doo 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 -doo. Nardwar. Yeah. nardwar fucking nardwar By May, I will probably have at least one single out from the new Charles Owens record. Sick. I don't know what the title will be. We put it right that. here. Thanks. Right, graphic department? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Oh, it looks great right there. Thank you. Yes. Good job, graphic department. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, Jessica Camilli, Rapid Eyes, is going to do the art again. Sick. Uh, She's a great artist, by the way. Man, I, I saw her. when I was at your uh, your space. I saw like you had some of the the mm -hmm. prints or pieces of it. Was yeah, one of them is an original like oil painting that I bought, and it's actually back at her studio right now. She borrowed it for a photo session. And nice. I'm like, please. I actually asked her. I'm like, well, I could take a different one and put it up. You know, like a little rotate exchange it. rotating. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, uh, yeah, so that the single is going to be out. I don't know what the name of the record is, but you know it'll be right here. It's already right here. <laughs> oh, that's right. It's been floating it's, there for a it, while. I, I don't know if it's been there the whole time because of editing, <laughs> but <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, uh, and I know that in May, um, Doe Eyes is going to headline at the Camel, and I've been playing with Doe Eyes. Shouts to Ali Thibodeau last year, a guest, right? Line of Note season one. Last summer, we kind of hooked up and started collaborating with each other, and then I started playing in Doe Eyes. And she changed like you know the whole band up, and it's like me and Carper and Kofi now, and uh, so we're going to be doing a residency at Dirty Nelly's first Saturday of every month, starting in April. Sick. And uh, we'll probably do a record at some point, you know. So. I like you. You stay busy. Yeah, man. Idle hands do the devil's work. <laughs> <laughs> or roll the devil's lettuce. It's true, man. Like, uh, but like I have to stay busy. But you know, I I have one leisure activity that's like. Totally, just to for leisure. And what is that? Video games. Okay. Yeah. All right. What's your What's your go to? There's, you know, the Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild is something that I put about two thousand, maybe twenty five hundred hours in. That's Switch, right? That's on a Switch. Yeah, with, with the Pro Controller. You said how many hours? About twenty five hundred hours. Holy shit! Because I got, I got, I got. Sorry, a, that, that went over my head the first time. Yeah, I got, a, you know, a Switch at the beginning of the pandemic, and. Uh, Basically, the reason why I got the Switch is I asked three different people who are, I highly respect, who are, you know, just wonderful dudes, who, what's the best video game? And they all said the same thing, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Shouts to Trey Pollard, CJ Wolf, and Randazzo. They all sold me the same thing. Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. So I got it, and it is the best video game. Come at me. 
Anyone sponsored. Who's watching it. Sponsored. <laughs> Charles Owen. Sponsored so, like, by. <laughs> you know, then I just sort of like threw myself into it, and uh, and you know I played the game through so many times now. I, when PS5 came out, I started to try to get them. It took me two years to get a PS5 like at regular price. You could go on eBay and pay twice, and I was just wasn't going to do that, you know. And so yeah. When I've practiced and I've done my yoga, I've taken care of my kids, made sure my wife is cool, made sure I, you know, took, did all my shit that I do that I love, you know. For me, I just like to sit and play some video games, and it's really nice, man. Like, I'll play for an hour, and then I'll put the controller down and be like, yo, that was great. You know, and yeah. then sort of just feel relaxed and happy. I think I, th I play a little bit of video games. I'm not a gamer, but I think I need to find a more peaceful game. Because I've been playing a lot of 2K23 yeah. and getting mad as shit when I don't For beat sure. the challenge. Yeah, I mean, Kofi always telling me, yeah, you got to play Elden Ring. Play Elden Ring. So I tried Elden Ring. Shit is way too hard. And it's, like, beautiful, but, like, it's dark as shit. Like, I'm just like, man, I'm depressed. You yeah, know? It's but not, like, not a relaxing video it's game. It's not, you know? And it's not, it's not really... I mean, the open world shit is like, oh, you try, you try to fight. Okay, you're not good enough. Go do some side shit for a while. Get better. Try it again. You know, sometimes they just force you into this shit, and it's like, oh man, this isn't fun. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, video games, man. Wow. Shouts, shouts to the Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild. Oh, the part two coming out in May. That PS5 is about to start gathering some dust at that Damn point. Dog. Man. I know. Man. Switch back on. <laughs> black, black. It actually started with my mom, like, I went grocery shopping with her and was starting to see all of the, alter all the options that are out there. I just was like, yo, like, I can make all kinds of pretzels. I would come up with a bunch of cravings and then start selling them at work. We I spent a lot of time, like, making sure every detail is, like, perfect. I just knew whatever was going to come out was going to be real because, like, I swear, I, I live and breathe this, like, handling creations. It was really important for us to be able to provide something for our vegan community, gluten-free community, our sugar-free community. The pretzels are like pretzel ladies. The cake pops are lady cakes. So just kind of trying to pour into that feminine energy and that, you know, I can have kids and still own my own business. Like, I can do it all. Does anybody else have a question? Did you find all the Koroks? <laughs> That's a great question, man. Mm, uh, I've done 119 out of the 120 shrines, but I have not found all the Koroks. However, Randazzo did a whole game where all he really wanted to do was find the Korok seeds, and he found all of them. Damn. Yeah, it, to the point where his, his wife like started getting flashbacks hearing the yeah, ha, ha, you found me. <laughs> so he doesn't want to hear that noise. Yo, any, the side again. missions on video games are like, I like that they put them in because them joints, you know, you finish a game and they're like, well, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I got to go find all Spider-Man's backpacks hidden throughout New York City. <laughs> or like, I know, and it's like really important, you know. Yeah, we're playing uh, Ninja <laughs> Turtles Shredder's Revenge mm -hmm. on the Switch <laughs> and you got to find like all the secret diaries that somebody like left. And, you know, it's, oh, it's man. It's a great fucking game. It can get tedious, but then like, you know, it's always rewarded. Yeah, video games are amazing, man. And like The Last of Us, you know, this the thing that came out on HBO? Yeah. That's like a another game. another show based on a video game. Yeah, we have Let's it. I loaded me. it. I played five minutes of it, and I was like, I'm out. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have never played the video game, but I've been watching that show, and that third episode that made everybody cry, I was like, all right, let's see. Did Let you cry? See. Yes, I did. Okay. On, the Amtrak, <laughs> on the Amtrak train, in front of everybody. It was Damn. fine. In front of God like, all. <laughs> So beautiful. Okay. Well, you're so you're like the second or third person that's told us about that show. So we might have to check yeah. that out. We might Man. have to check that out. You got a question, Mel? Uh, yes. Uh, what is your favorite song to play? And I got two parts. What is your favorite song to play? Uh -huh. And what is the is there a distinct difference in musicians from north to south? Oh. Okay. Good questions. What is my favorite song to play? That is really, really tough, man. Um, you know, because I like to play a bunch of songs <laughs> from different artists. I like to play my own songs. Um, so 
I will say that um, I have a song that I've recorded multiple times. It's called Losing Victory. And it's kind of like my hit song, right? Because I recorded it in New York with my New York band. Then I, it's on As One with Kelly and Devon. And then I also recorded a big band version, the big band arrangement by Andrew Randazzo. And, you know, my wife and I have been married for 21 years now. And, uh, yeah, but when we first got together, we got together and it was like, it was like crazy, just hot and heavy. Like we fell in love really fast and she, uh, freaked out and broke up with me oh. for a minute. And so it happens. I, I was crushed. <laughs> I was crushed. And I wrote this song called Losing Victory and her name's VJ. And in, in, it means victory translated. It's an Indian man's name, VJ, but translated means victory. So losing victory and the title was sort of like, you know. Uh, dedicated to her, and I wanted to portray a sense of longing in the composition, missing her, you know. And uh, every time I play that tune, man, everybody loves it, you know. And so it's kind of my favorite because I wrote it. It's near and dear to my heart, and uh, it always goes over great. Like, it always kills, you know. <laughs> and uh, the difference between North and South musicians, you know, like the difference between Richmond and New York, New York, everybody's art should be a reflection of their life and their reality, you know, and the life and reality in New York is different than the life and reality in Virginia in that New York has a lot, it, it, the energy is um, higher, and I don't necessarily mean that in a good or a bad way, it's just the energy is different and it, it, is, it comes out in one's music, you know. Um, I mean, a, a great example would be like if you listen to um, Nick Payton, is one of my favorite artists, shouts to Nick Payton, he's a great a friend and artist he makes records with New York musicians but he also made records with Butcher Brown you know and the New York musicians the New York records have that New York vibe of like high energy slickness killing like super in the tradition of swing in a lot of ways um, and then you know the Butcher Brown record has this more laid-back country greasy backbeat but still in the same exact spirit you know Black American music is brought up, brought up forth with a certain spirit, and it's either there or it's not. And uh, um, and jazz and backbeats and Butcher Brown and um, basically all the music that was popular in the 20th century I consider to be Black American music. So um, the spirit is always there. It's really about the energy with which it's brought forth, you know, and the energy. Uh, with, with, with which it's brought forth is provided by one's environment, you know, one's life, daily life. So, yeah, I think that's the difference. Right. You like it here? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. You're on camera now. <laughs> well, I mean, of course, I, I would, you know, uh, let, me, let me just say about if I like it here or not. Yeah, so I grew up in Northern Virginia, so I'm a Virginia person, um, but Northern Virginia is a lot different than here, you know. Um, and... I left New York for a multitude of reasons, but uh, you know, in New York, people are living above you, all around you. It's really noisy, it's really expensive, and it's hard to get some peace and quiet, you know. Um, and uh, it was starting to cause me like some actual mental problems, <laughs> you know, having people like walking up above me and hearing that, and then listening to people like yell at each other below me. And always having like sirens and nah, nah, and then having a little baby, you know, little baby girl. Um, and I really like it in Virginia. And every time I, I go to New York a lot to play smalls, three or four times a year. And every time I go back, I'm like, yeah, I, I want to go back to Virginia. <laughs> and that's nothing. That's nothing against New York because New York uh, is part of what made me who I am today. It made me the mu a big part of what mu made me the musician I am today. And I love going back there. But it's a really difficult way of life, you know. And uh, I like to go hiking, you know. And I like to have space in my house where I could like do yoga and have just a room where I only play music, you know. And uh, I bought a house in Richmond, and it's this big, beautiful house, and it was not expensive at all <laughs> comparatively <laughs> compared to New York. I mean, well, from what I got, it's, you know, it's huge. It's like f four bedrooms and three bathrooms on a half acre of land. And, yeah, that's forty-five million dollars in New York. <laughs> I mean, it's like doesn't even exist, you know. It's like crazy. Um, so, yes, man, I do love it here, and I'm going to stay here. I'm not going to move back to New York. Um, uh, I, I love all the opportunities that I've had. And, man, I'm so busy. Like, uh, people are calling me for stuff. 
playing with Landon Elliott for the first time this, Sick. this, this, this month at uh, his residency at Poe's Pub. Shouts to Landon Elliott. Um, yeah, Richmond is giving me all these great opportunities. I get to go to the Roots Jam every Monday, and it's like a 10-minute drive. <laughs> you know? Uh, man, yes, I do love it here. We enjoyed having you on the liner notes set and can't wait to share it. Did you write this before? So thank God you actually enjoyed it. Because <laughs> I could have been like terrible. Yeah, it, we had a separate card if you were a dick. Oh, thanks. A, <laughs> Can you guys let me see that one too? Yeah, yeah, and Max, grab that card for him. <laughs> grab the dick card. <laughs> it's just a whole bunch of little middle fingers that we drew. Man, get the fuck out of here. Uh, Give me this back. is really sweet, you guys. Thank you so much for this. This is really cool. I, uh, you know, I, I'm really honored that you asked me to be on here and that you guys care about things that I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you were in the DMs. Oh. Yeah, you, you were on our good list for a, a long while. Yeah, well, um, I loved I loved hearing it. There might not be anything in there. I think it's yeah. It's just nice paper though. Really, guys? No. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. We love it. Stickers and a mug. Ah, uh, thank you so much. No, no problem. Shouts to here, RVA, man. No, and then this is the best part of it. So I'll fold mm -hmm. this up real neatly for you. Mm -hmm. I'm sure our audio op is loving the crinklies right <laughs> next to the microphone. So, you know, I have something really important <laughs> that I want to say right now. And it's this. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Did you get that? <laughs> oh, yeah, that good. Uh, good. Good. <laughs> um, cool. Last thing. We got uh, two last things. One, oh. if you could look into this camera. Say something cool like, wow, my name is Charles Owens, I do the jazz, and this is liner notes, and go like this. Um, you don't have to do it in, a, in an accent if you don't want. Uh, but I'm down for it if you do want to do it in an accent. Um, mm. But just... <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is too much, dude. <laughs> what? Do it nice. Do no. whatever you want, yes. So when do I do this though? After or before the statement? Um, I'm gonna leave that up to artistic expression, it's improvisation, too much. It's too much. improvisation, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my my fee just increased. You want me to improvise, man? Come on. Uh, I'm not paying nothing. you anything <laughs> now, so <laughs> increase like, whatever you want. Zero times. Anything zero times zero. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I know math. Oh my God. Okay, you ready? Hello, this is Charles Owens. Saxophone solos are my magic power, and this is here RVA. Thank you.